can I ask you if, if you were always a behind the scenes man or did you appear in court and present uh, evidence? I have appeared in court, yes, but not, not to give expert opinion uh, like that because I'm not thinking for an expert, I'm not an expert witness. What my role was to explain, well, how did we go about the examination of the crime scene? Why did we do this? So why did we decide not to recover all the cigarette ends from the crime scene? Uh, and that questioning is very much by the defence. You're not really appearing for the prosecution. Well, you are appearing for the prosecution, but they don't really want you. It's the defence that want you there to try and catch you out. Actually, you didn't recover all the cigarette ends then. And you need to be able to explain why your policy was as it was. And that policy at the crime scene is worked out in conjunction with the senior police officer. Um, you don't do it in isolation. But if you had a murder uh, in the street, it would not be productive to say, well, I know, let's 100 yards either side of where the body is, let's scoop up all the cigarette ends, all the empty drinks cans, anything we can find, let's scoop it all up, because some of that might have fingerprints or DNA of the offender on it. Yes, it might do, but it'll have uh, fingerprints and DNA of anybody who's walked down that street in recent times. So, whilst you might say, well, that policy would cover every eventuality, it would not, would not work in practice because what the police want is targeted and focused evidence collection. Because both money and time would limit how much of that you've scooped up you can actually process. So if um, the murder only happened two hours ago, we're looking for evidence that's likely only been there in the last two hours. We don't want the rusty old drinks can that's clearly been sitting in the, uh, in the gutter for a month. So, and um, that's the sort of question you would get. Well, why did you decide not to recover the cigarette ends? Why did you decide only to take the boundary of the crime scene to that door there? Interesting. I'm going to talk about both fingerprints and DNA um, because they are the two types of evidence that enable you to say to the police who's committed the crime and who you think's committed the crime if the police haven't got a clue. Things like glass, if you're trying to compare the broken glass at the house burglary with the glass you find on someone's clothing, the footwear mark outside of the kitchen window where somebody got into the house with someone's shoe, all of that only works if the police first of all go out and find someone. Find someone they think is a suspect to get the glass off their jumper, find someone they think is a suspect to get the footwear, and then forensic science can work to make that comparison, to compare the two items to say, is this the shoe with the mark out the kitchen window? Is the glass on the jumper the same as the glass from the broken window? But if the police don't know who's committed the crime, they need fingerprints and DNA. Because fingerprints and DNA will not only say, and this is the person you need to speak to, and here's the evidence as well. So here's the fingerprint on the television set in the house that was burgled, that's the evidence, and here's the name of the guy whose fingerprint it is. And that makes the job a lot easier for the police, which is why today, fingerprints and DNA are the big two. They're the two most useful types of evidence for uh, forensic science to assist the police. The others do have their place, but to a lesser extent, because particularly with what the police call volume crime, like burglaries and auto crime, crimes that happen quite a lot, they're very numerous, in order to detect them, you need somebody to say, well, there's the evidence, and this is also the guy we think who's done it. So the police job then is very much arrest, interview, charge. The time to go out and the police do old-fashioned police work looking for people they think it might be just doesn't exist today for those sorts of crimes. That sort of effort <coughs> is reserved for major inquiries simply because the volume of the... Uh, Burgers and auto kind would exclude that. So fingerprint is really good because it gives you the conclusive evidence. Your fingerprint is different to everybody else's. If it's your fingerprint in the house, it's your fingerprint. No argument. Conclusive evidence. You'll never get better than that. That's why it will convict on its own. It's got to be you. Can't explain how it got there. That will got to be you. The DNA profile then. Um, is ever so slightly different because whilst your DNA is unique to you unless you're an identical twin, the technology only samples a tiny little bit of the entire DNA molecule. And it's a tiny little bit 
but is known to differ greatly in individuals. So you do get some discriminating power. And the current technology um, is the same as it has been since 1999, so it's well over 10 years old now, is that if you get what's termed a full DNA profile, all the points that are looked for are present and can be profiled. If you get a full profile, that's given to the police with some statistical odds that says, well, this is a match, and the chances of it not being this individual, one in a billion. So if the DNA profile at the crime scene matched me, if we then put a billion people in a room, as well as it being a bit crowded, one of those will have the same DNA profile as me. Because that DNA profile is in a tiny little bit of the entire molecule. So it is possible to get what's termed an adventitious hit, where quite by chance, the DNA of this person happens to match the DNA of the crime scene, but it wasn't him or her. The chances of it are very, very slim because the odds are greater than the population in England and Wales, so it's very unlikely. But it's not conclusive evidence. And if all the police have for a crime is a DNA profile that links you to that burglary, that links you to that car crime, that is insufficient to prosecute because the DNA evidence on its own is not conclusive. So the DNA evidence is extremely strong evidence, but you need something else to go with it. You need maybe to have been arrested two streets from where the house burglary took place. You need to be caught in possession of some stolen property from the house. You need to be arrested in possession of tools similar that were used to break into the house. You need something else to go with it. You don't need that for fingerprints, but you do with DNA. Well, the, the original rationale for the database was that when the technology existed, that if we got people on the database early, when they were committing relatively minor offences, like maybe burglary and auto crime, if they ever progressed to more serious offences, like sexual offences, you're going to catch them quicker. And you're going to prevent things like the Yorkshire Cup. So that was the rationale for why we need um, a DNA database. The Forensic Science Service, I'm sure, whilst it still existed, would have said, well, the more, the better the processing power is there, and the bigger number of samples, the better statistics we get about some of the periphery information we're allowed to give, which is based around, well, uh, we can't identify who this person is who's left DNA for crime scene because they're not on our database, but we do know from the pool of people we do have that the person who's left this DNA is likely to be black, white, Indian, Asian. So, um, technology-wise, there's no reason why the extra samples are clogging up. It's, it, that's not really an argument. It's really one around um, civil liberties. Why? If I haven't done anything wrong, what are you doing with my DNA and fingerprints?